Good afternoon. This is our ninth session, second module, uh, review of basic structural analysis. So we are still doing the force methods, but we hope to complete it in this session. We will cover approximate methods of lateral load analysis, and this is in part four of the book on structural analysis. Now I have given you an assignment. And I'd like you, I'd like to help you solve this assignment. So take a look at this uh, truss. What is the degree of indeterminacy in this truss? It's one, right? Okay. Is it internal or external? Internal. Clearly internal. Uh, now the problem given to you is a little more complicated. You have a cable, so it's a cable suspended truss. Now what's the degree of indeterminacy? Three, two, 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 two. two. See, uh, you have an additional unknown force. What is that unknown force? Tension. So force in the cable. Okay, so uh, so you've got a degree of indeterminacy two. So how do you solve this problem? Can you treat the cable as another truss element? No. Why not? Yeah, but in this case it is obvious it is going to be in tension, so you can, okay. So in this case you can treat the cable as another truss member, you can number it 7. So how do you go about solving this problem? Now the question asked is analyze this truss, find the bar forces and the cable tension plus a, a deflection question. Can you find the vertical deflection at or given that the vertical deflection at C is 12 mm, find the value of Ea. Okay, the actual rigidity and for the cable you are told the value of the actual rigidity is 2 times that of each bar in that truss. So let us see how we can do this problem. You need to choose 2 redundants. Okay. One clearly you can choose the cable itself and the other one could be any bar let us say bar number 6 the diagonal. So you cut the these 2 elements and uh, you can number them. So let us say x1 is the unknown force in the bar number 6 and uh, x2 is the unknown force in the cable which is element number 7. Is it clear? Assume tension positive. Uh, you know how to solve this. So there are many ways of solving it. Basically you have to invoke compatibility conditions. If you do the method of consistent deformations you have to write it in that flexibility format or you could use uh, the theorem of least work. You are familiar with this you will do it. Now this part is easy. How will you find the vertical deflection at C? You give a unit displacement at C in the same system right. Unit force at C, unit load at C but then that statically indeterminate. Does it mean you have to solve that statically indeterminate problem all over again for this condition or is there an easier way out? So this is what you would be doing right solve again x1 and x2 for this problem find the bar forces and so on right. But that that is a lot of work. Can we make it simpler? I have hinted at this when we covered the principle of virtual work, the unit load method. There is a tremendous power in that method. What is the small distance? You need to analyze this truss, right? This truss is statically indeterminate. You need to solve a 2 by 2 matrix to get x1, x, uh, x1 and x2 in this part, right? What is a simple way out? Any, anybody? Which really reduces a problem. No, it is a mind boggling. So, yes? There are no 0, 4. Well, those you have to do anyway, but it is indeterminate. Anybody? Take that identity. Just go back to the principle of virtual work. What was the requirement of the force field? That it should 
it should be statically admissible. We are looking at that field. Uh, is it required that that system should also be kinematically admissible? No. So, can you take advantage of this? How many statically admissible force fields can you draw for this? Infinite. So, choose one which is easy. What is the easiest one? Easy. So, this is you make x 1 x 2 to be 0, <laughs> right. I mean you can use choose any numbers, any combination that you want, but this it cannot be easier than this. So, now you are left with finding 5 unknown bar forces, which is very easy to do, right. Then you invoke the unit load method, that is it. So, this is something uh, which most students do not know, it is a power inherent in this uh, principle of virtual forces. Is it clear? You can do this problem? Right. Now, let us look at another problem, which you have in your assignment. In this problem, you have a hinge. Please note, there is a hinge at B. There is an internal hinge at B. How do you solve this problem? The problem is, you have to analyze. Well, you need to analyze both the arches. Both are parabolic arches. You need to draw the bending moment diagram etcetera for the first arch A D B right. You do not worry about the B C arch. So, how do you solve this problem? Can you simplify it? No, you have two arches you learn how to solve one arch right. You got two joined together like like what, what are they called what twins are they? Siamese twins yes. Uh, so, what do you do? You separate them, right. When you separate them, how would you separate them? Same roller support. You need to separate the two arches. Same forces, same horizontal forces. Same horizontal forces. You see, the second arch is completely unloaded. Yes, sir, we give, we give the horizontal force from the B. But how do you find the horizontal? In the arch From problems first. you have studied till now, there were two hinged arches. That support B was a hinge support not moving. Now, you have a roller there, but you have a restraint coming from the other arch. So, can you separate out that first arch? No, no. B is still going to move. No, so How do you, but it is not, it is not free to move because the other arch does not want to be moved. So, how do you deal with this? Yeah, you said whatever method you do it is not easy. Yes, you put a spring wonderful that is right you put a spring right. Now, you can use energy method etcetera provided you can know what that spring stiffness k is. So, how do you find that spring stiffness k? Yes, material property, not displacement. Material you, properties. You take the other arch and you push it horizontally at B by some force, say F, and see how much it moves. Delta. Uh, by the way, look at this arch. The vertical reactions are statically determined, right? Horizontal reaction H is not known. If that spring stiffness were to be infinity, you know how to solve the problem. If it's zero h is going to be 0, because it is simply supported, but the value of k is going to determine the value of h, right. It will lie between these two bounds 0 and the value you get when k is infinite. How do you get k? Well, take the second arch, which is the same as the first arch and apply a force f, it is going to move, right. Can you see it moving in that picture, right. Now, how do you find this delta? How do you find that? You can use any of the methods, but the easiest would be to use the energy method itself. So, do you agree k is f by delta? If you use the energy method, you will find that the bending moment at any section in that arch is only due to f. So, it is f into y, it is a hogging moment minus f y. Do you agree? And if you bring in Castigliano's theorem, delta 
is d u star by d f right, which you can write in this uh, form agree. And you need to integrate only on one half, because it is a symmetric arch. Now, m is nothing but minus f y and d m by d f will therefore, be minus y. So, will not you take this format. Now, you have to use a trick which we learnt in the last session. Yeah, you make that assumption i is equal to i naught square root of 1 plus y dash square and that expression will delta will now simplify. I am actually leaking out the solution to you. It will simplify to, to this quantity and this quantity is a constant for the arch. You remember we, we found this and that takes this value. Okay. Remember it was 4 by 8 or something. So, it is 8 h squared l by 15. So, you got an expression for k in terms of E i naught, in terms of E i naught. Now, what do you do? Now, you come back to the original arch. How do you still solve it? Here it be, it must be equal. Well, let us stick to the energy method, which is what we use for solving the parabolic arch. So, you have to go back to the derivation of how you found capital H. How did you find it? Right, you began with complementary strain energy, but now you realize that the complementary strain energy is has two components one that of the arch due to the bending of the arch, and the second is due to the spring. Do you agree? That is the addition term. This is how you should think because real life problems are like this. You want to simplify it, this is how you deal with it. Otherwise, you have to work with both the arches. Now, if you run that derivative through the second term. Do you agree the spring is half uh, h squared by k because the force in the spring is, is h? Do you agree? And the derivative turns out to be h by k, which is nothing but the deflection in the spring, right? K you already know, so you can now use this concept and get an expression for h. So go back to the original theory, you will find when there was no spring, this term was not there, E i naught by k was not there, that is k was infinite, infinity, right. So, you can, I want you to derive it from first principles, you will find you can do this and, uh, and you know the denominator, uh, you can add up, add up this value of k here with an, a value that we have derived for for the parabolic arch. Now, it is easy to do. right? I've, you need to first chalk out the road map given a problem and then proceed. So, it is an interesting problem. So, will you do this? I have given you two problems, both related to force methods. Now, in this session, before we take approximate lateral load analysis, let us complete some discussions on elastic supports. Now, Take a look at this, it is a little complicated, we will study this in grids later, <coughs> but uh, you can always try to separate out elements, but you must put the right <coughs> restraints when you separate them out. For example, if I want to separate out that cantilever A B, what should I put at B to, to simulate the effect of the connecting beam C B D? One spring. Rotational spring. Yeah. So, you need to put two springs, a rotational spring and a translational spring and you need to figure out those stiffness values which are simply k will be you apply a force vertically downward at b and uh, find out its deflection and the stiffness turns out to be k into it is about 48 L cube by E i and so on and the rotational spring you have to apply a unit torque at that point b and so on. I want you to get the concept. Okay, You can handle many problems like this. Similarly, you can have uh, cable suspended truss and so on. Let us take a very simple problem. Okay, You have a cantilever. It is not a propped cantilever because a prop is elastic. You have a spring there of known stiffness k. How will it deflect? Well, these are the, let us say the force in that spring is x and so the other reaction will be p minus x and the bending moment. So, x is the single redundant, right. How will it deflect? 
well it will deflect like that C may go down a bit and so on right. And what will be the shear force in bending moment diagram something like that clear easy to draw. Now it will be interesting to find out how x is related to the spring stiffness can you guess k equal to 0 x equal to 0. So, if you had to plot k with x how would this figure look is okay, so one point is here right. k is infinity it is p by 2 will it be p by 2 oh sorry k is infinity means you are dealing with this situation right do you know the answer for this do you know the fixed end moment for a propped cantilever We will need this again and again in future sessions, but let us go back to fundamentals. Let us say it is a fixed beam. Do you remember the answer for this? This is P, this is L by 2, L by 2. What are these fixed end moments? P L by? P L by 8. You can prove this by conjugate beam method. So, remember this is P L by 8. And this will be, will be well. Uh, you need, you need to take this beam. We'll discuss this later, in, and reverse this moment. Right? This is clockwise hogging. So if I apply a loading like this, then when I add up these two, I get zero moment there right but when i do this it will take a shape how it will take a shape like that right and what do you think this moment will be this is going to be how much you've studied this okay we'll study it this will be always half this value for a prismatic beam okay so uh, take it right now we will prove it in the next class in, in a greater way. So, you will find that whenever you have a kind of symmetric loading this value will be always this value into into 1 and a half it's 1 and a half times the conventional fixed end moment. So, how much will it be 3 3 16 and once you know this you can find your reaction how much will this be well if this moment was not there it will be p by 2 p by 2 so this is x so it is p by 2 but due to the moment this will increase and this will reduce by how much this divided by l that is 3 p by 16 how much you get 5 p by 16. So, as k tends to infinity uh, you cannot exceed this value right this value will be 5 p by 16. How do you think this moves from 0 to 5 p by 16 some non linear way can you generate an equation. So, let us look at that it is interesting to do these kind of problems you can use the energy method remember there are two energies here one from the beam and one from the spring just like we did the arch with a spring problem and uh, invoke the theorem of least work okay do you agree to this equation it's a straightforward equation and uh, let's assume you can do all these integrations you see this part you have to write the expression for bending moment and you expand it and you can solve it and finally you will get an expression which is a function of this k and e i. So, let us say k is lambda times e i by l cubed. In other words I am trying to relate 
the spring stiffness with the beam stiffness. The stiffness parameters in the beam are related to E i by L. So, let the spring stiffness be lambda times E i by L cubed. I have chosen lambda in, in a manner that it is non dimensional. So, it will be interesting to plot this relationship and you will find the relationship is non linear as he rightly said it will asymptotically hit the peak value of 5 p by 16. For example, if lambda is 12 x turns out to be p by 4. So, uh, this is a complete way of, of uh, understanding uh, that spring type behavior. So, it is somewhere the actual behavior is somewhere between a cantilever and a propped cantilever. Let us take a more difficult problem and we will uh, stop this section with that. Let us say you have a hall a room with uh, a grid of beams like this it is symmetric okay. grid of beams. So, you have one long beam from A to B and two shorter beams and let us say they are simply supported that means they are resting on pillars they are non monolithic supports. So, assuming the beams to have identical flexural rigidity E i which comes from they are having the same cross section same width and same depth and zero torsional rigidity which comes from the fact that they are concrete and concrete cracks easily. Analyze the grid system given that the segment g h is subjected to a uniformly distributed load of 100 kilo Newton. Draw the shear force and bending moment diagrams of beams c d and a b. Now, here I am only going to give you the concept and I request you to go through the detailed calculation that at your leisure it is all given in the book. So, conceptually how will you deal with this problem it looks complicated separate out. So, uh, which one will you separate out C D and E F from A B which do you think is supporting which A B is supporting C D and E F A B is supporting or C D and E F are supporting. All are interconnected. We can't say. That. You can't you say or can you say for sure? Can't. We can't say. See, G H is loaded. What's your hin hunch? What's your intuition? Supporting C D and A B is supporting C D and E F. C D and E F are supporting. C D and E F are supporting. C D and E F are supporting because they are stiffer. See the stiffer fellows will support the, the you know the not so stiff beam can't you feel it ultimately the deflections are the same. So, it does not matter let us say you made a mistake uh, it will show up with a negative sign in your reaction, but it is good to get it intuitively right straight. So, this do, do, do you think this is a good ap approach that means I have replaced the connecting beams C D and E F with two identical springs fine. And this is the loading the, the G H is on A B. So, I have to take out A B separately do you agree this is perfect. Now, I need a value of k what is the value of k? k is the flexural stiffness of the beams C D and E F. So, how do I do that? So, both of them are simply supported beams what is the span of the beam? Total no? I am talking of C D the, the ones that I am going to replace they are 10 meters right 10 meters. So, if I want to replace this with one spring k I apply say some force f some force f this is going to deflect let us say this is delta let us say this comes down by the same delta that is that is how I replace that entire beam with a spring right you see the the power in this method. So, is there a formula for delta that you that you can easily derive what is delta what is delta do not remember that is right. So, if the load is f you should say f f into 10 cube by 
40 AD, you are right. So, K turns out to be F by that is it. So, you can do that, it does not take you much time, you have got that and now you can analyze the beam. So, your compatibility equation is uh, the deflection at either G or H, the, your compatibility equation is let us say x 1 and x 2 are the forces uh, at the bottom of the spring, the reactions right. Obviously, x 1 is going to be equal to x 2 right. So, let us cut the spring at the base let us see how much it moves, it should not move, there should be no separation between the cut ends. So, your compatibility condition is D 1 L that is the deflection here caused by this loading in the cut springs plus F 1 1 x 1 plus F 1 2 x 2 this must be equal to 0, that is just conventional compatibility equation. You can work out all those quantities and taking note of the fact that x 1 is equal to x 2 it reduces to that equation. So, I will quickly show you how you can do that. You need to now find out D 1 L, F 1 1 and F 1 2 right. So, your first thing is you need the bending moment diagram when x 1 and x 2 are 0 in the primary structure that is easy to do ok. You have a U D L, so you have a parabola in the middle and you have two straight lines and those areas are easy to compute. Then you apply x 1 equal to 1 that means you pull that spring down by x 1 equal to 1 and you have a force in the spring, but you also have a bending moment in the beam and that bending moment diagram is a linear diagram like that. That is what we call m 1 diagram and then you pull the other spring down with a unit load you have m 2 diagram which is the same as m 1, but laterally inverted ok. So, you have these diagrams, so you can you not calculate d 1 l, what is d 1 l? d 1 l is the product of comes from the product of this diagram and this diagram okay, which you can work out, it is not difficult. What is f 1 1? f 1 1 is a product of this diagram with itself f 1 2 is this with this, f 2 2 is this with itself. So, these are simple things you have done before, but remember f 1 1 has two contributions, one from the beam and one from the spring, because the spring also elongates, the spring also elongates. So, the spring also moves, the spring movement is a well is a value that you already know. Okay. So, you can work this out you can write f 1 1, f 1 2 and so on. Conceptually is this clear? Okay, you might encounter such problems in real life, when you simplify you have a powerful technique to solve them and you can plug in those numbers, solve for x 1 and, and now once you know the value of x 1, you see how it comes, you let us say x 1 is 45.83 kilo Newton minus which means it is compression. So, you have a force acting here and the same force acts downward on the supporting beam, is it clear? And the, these diagrams are easy to draw, you can draw the shear force and the bending moment diagrams, this is complete. So, all you had was one unknown x 1 and x 2 was equal to x 1, you can solve this problem. So, this is how you deal with uh, elastic supports. Now, straight away we will go to the last topic in this uh, session. Uh, if you have tall buildings, you have a problem of both vertical load transfer and horizontal load transfer. So, let us take a typical framed building like this, you have columns and beams. So, can you see this, this is the framing plan where you have columns and beams, they are integrally connected and the loads are transmitted from the slabs to the beams to the columns to the foundations ok, story by story, it is simple to understand. This is vertical load transmission, what about horizontal load transmission? Well, it goes to the foundation through frame action, so you have to analyze this plane frame, 
if you separate out the frames you can do that. How do you do horizontal load transfer? Let us say wind is acting on the face of the building, you have cladding uh, which will uh, come in the way of the wind velocity. So, there is wind pressure, you can calculate the wind force, the wind pressure will increase with the height of the building. Let us say you can work out those pressures and, uh, and you can find out let us say the force acting in, uh, in an isolated frame at every floor level. How do you do that? Well, some people take just the wind pressure and multiply by the tributary area that means half the width on one side and half. Well, that is one way of doing it, it works if your frames are all symmetric, but that would mean that your end frame the last one would take half the load compared to an intermediate frame. Do you think that is that's the way it is going to behave? Why not? Well, in reality that whole building is going to move as a whole. It moves as a whole because of the slabs being integrally present there. So, the slabs serve a function not only of transmitting the vertical loads, but also is acting as a diaphragm. You know what a diaphragm is? It holds the structure together. So, if you push one frame, the diaphragm as a whole uh, makes sure that load is shared by all the other frames as well. Is it clear? Now, if the building is not very long, let us say it moves together, that means all the frames are deflecting by the same amount at any particular floor level, agree. So, if you replace them with springs, that means they all will take the same load, they all will, because all the frames are identical, let us say. If all the frames have the same size of beams and columns, they have the same lateral stiffnesses. So, they really take the same load. So, if you have the total load F at any floor level, you just have to divide it by as many frames as there are. Supposing the frames are non identical, then you will apportion the load in proportion to the relative stiffnesses. The stiffer frames will attract more load than the less stiff ones. This is some general uh, knowledge. Now, if you take out a plane frame, well, you have this longitudinal frame, you have to include the slab and the beam. Some people ignore the slab contribution, but the slab in compression actually helps the, the stiffness in the frame. So, you call it a slab beam member. So, this is a typical frame, but there are two frames. There are frames in the transverse direction as well. So, when the wind is acting normal to the front face of this building, it is a transverse frame which will take the load. So, you have to work it out. Uh, Let us take a simple problem. Okay. Can you analyze this frame? This is a portal frame, it is symmetric. There is a load P, we discussed this earlier. That load will be shared equally P by 2, P by 2, and that makes it statically determinant if this frame is symmetric. Remember, we proved this earlier. And so, this has a bending moment diagram as shown, drawn on the tension side, it has a deflection diagram as shown. The question I am going to ask you is, can you tell me what is that deflection in terms of P or what is the lateral stiffness of this frame? What does it depend on? It depends on I B and I C, right. Let us say I B is infinity, that means you have a rigid beam. How much will that deflection be? The columns are flexible, columns will sway, but the beam will move like a rigid body. How much will it move? Let us say you isolate one of those columns, how will it look like? It is not a cantilever, the bottom you have a hinge. So, can you make it look like this? So, you see this picture. I have taken out the column, on top I put a, a spring, a rotational spring, okay, a rotational spring. Uh, if that spring stiffness is infinite, then when it sways, it will sway with a, the slope theta being equal to 0, but it will still sway. 
in Sills way. Now compatibility demands that the same theta is passed on to, to the beam. Now I can cut the beam at E at the middle because that is where I have a point of contraflexure. There is no shear transfer so I can put a roller there. So this is a clever way of, of simplifying the whole problem. Now the question is how do I find delta? Well let us take one extreme case where k is infinite then can you tell me what the answer will be. Let us say theta is 0, how much will it move? Now it is a function of E i c by h. How to find it? That is right, it will be same as the cantilever. See, look at that picture. It is taken this shape. What is the force here? P by so, 2. It is like a situation like this, right? This is P by 2, this is H. What do you think this deflection is? Is it so difficult? Huh? P by 2 into h cube by by 3 3 e i c it's not difficult you must be alert whenever you see a deflected shape like this it should remind you it's like a, a hung cantilever is it clear and the formulas are there to help you so it's not that tough you must develop the ability to to write this down and uh, Okay. The other point to note is you also know an expression for theta, right? If you have a simply supported beam of span L by two, do you agree that that the relationship between the moment and that beam? Let's say I have a beam, elastic beam. and I apply some moment here say m, m naught. This is going to rotate like this. What is the relationship between these two angles do you know? This is twice that okay. and what is this relationship? Theta will be m naught l by 3 e i. Right? So that is what we have done here. So you have these relationships. So you have an expression for theta and uh, if you take, take the rigid beam idealization, you do you agree to this cantilever action of the moment of the column, you get delta not equal to this quantity which we just derived. right? Now let us say theta is not equal to 0, in reality it would not be equal to 0 because the beam is not infinitely rigid beam has a finite stiffness E i b by L. Then what is the additional deflection that you have? So delta will be delta naught plus what? Rigid body rotation. So how much will that be? Theta into? H. Theta into H. You must think like that. If theta is not there, you have delta naught. If that spring is finite, you have a you have a rotation here. It's a rigid body rotation. So rigid body rotation. So you have it's as though this this rotated by an angle theta, and so you have an additional movement here, which is theta into h. So that's a clever way of of simplifying and breaking down and understanding and you can do that, right. So you have a nice expression, if you simplify it you can write an expression for delta, you have a value of theta, uh, 
and if you bring in a stiffness parameter which we have introduced earlier E i b by L to E i c by H, then you can write an expression for k, this is not very important. Okay. You, I just want you to get a general sense of how we can simplify things, but I want you to remember the limits. So, you can write k in terms of gamma and you will find that the maximum value will be 6 E i c by h cubed, which is when the beam is infinitely rigid. If the beam is infinitely flexible, you have a problem, the system becomes unstable, because you have two internal hinges there and you have very large deflections, it will not survive. So, is this clear? So, this is one typical extreme problem. Let us take the same portal frame and fix it at the bottom. Okay. This is now statically indeterminate earlier it was hinged at the base. Now, let us begin with the rigid beam idealization. This building is sometimes referred to as a shear building, okay. it is a, uh, it's a shear mode of movement. Now, you see how it is going to behave. If I b is infinite, it will just slide horizontally and this is fixed on top, fixed here, it is kind of guided roller here, guided fixed. So, the slope there is 0, the slope here is 0. Do you agree that this point of contraflexion will be in the middle? Do you also agree this p that these two columns will move identically? They will have the same bending moments and same shear force. Do you also agree that this load p will be shared equally by the two columns? Now, can you give me an expression for delta naught with that knowledge? Okay, look carefully. Can you give me an expression for delta naught in terms of P, E and I C and H? Please work it out. See this is how you check. Let us say someone in, in your structural engineering design office comes up with some value. You should at least make sure the value makes sense. It should lie within appropriate bounds. So, this is one extreme your actual deflection will be more than this. This is the least value of the deflection you can get when the beam is infinitely rigid. What is that formula for delta naught? Okay. Where that hinge is located, what is the movement? Let us, so look at the, look at the isolated mod. It will move by delta naught by 2, right? in the middle. You see here, if this overall movement is delta, do you agree this is delta naught by 2? Can you write an expression for delta naught by 2? That is easy, that is a cantilever, right? and it is 2 times that. So, is it okay to say that delta naught is this into 2, where this is p by 2 into h by 2, the whole q by 3 e i c. It is the same formula, except I am taking half the height now. Is it because of uh, parity, because of parity, because if you flip it upside down also it does not change. It is like the settlement of supports problem. Let us say I had, I had a, a beam like this fixed here, right. Let us say I push this down. So, what is a deflected shape? Let us say this is what this is a chord rotation. The deflected shape will be 0 slope there, goes down like that, goes down. Okay, I, right. Now, does it matter whether this goes down or goes up? Cannot you feel that the point of contraflexure will be bang in the middle? If it is a prismatic beam, imagine this goes down. So, these are all reversible. So, this point of contraflexure will always be in the middle of the beam, right. You keep moving it up and down, this, this chord rotation is going to be like that. And if this is delta, this has to be delta. You are not convinced? Sir, even if you do move it up and down, still how does the 
Okay. Let us say, let us say you move it up. Let us say you move it up. What will be the deflected shape? Right? The bending moment diagram for this is going to be like this. Bending moment diagram for this is going to be like this, right. Now, when I add up these two, what should I get? I should get 0, the beam will be flat, <coughs> agreed, and I can flip it over, I can flip it over, right. So, it does not matter. So, we talk of chord rotation, it is not whether the right support goes down or the left support goes up. You have a clockwise chord rotation here, which we call phi. You have an anti clockwise chord rotation here. The points of contraflexion will always be in the middle. And let us finish it because we need this uh, knowledge later. Let us work it out. So, let us say this force here is P. Equilibrium demands that this also is. Right, and what do you think this deflection is? Delta two will be p into l by two the whole cube by. It's a small cantilever, right? I can cut it there by three i. It's a clever way of solving the problem. So this turns out to be. Remember this. This is p. L cubed by 24 E i or you can say P is equal to 12 E i by L cubed into delta. So, you have a relationship between this delta and this P. It is very important to remember this relationship. Now, what is your moment? You get a moment here is acting down. So, you have shears acting down and up. You have a moment here. You also have a moment here. What are these moments going to be equal to? P into L by 2. How much does it turn out to be? P into L by 2 is how much if P is this. So, it turns out to be the moment is 6 C i by L squared into delta. These are very important formulas 6 E i by L squared into delta. So, the summary of what we have done here is if you have a clockwise chord rotation, okay, you can also write this as 6 E i by L into chord rotation phi because phi is delta by L. Assuming delta is very small compared to L, is it clear? So, if I have a clockwise chord rotation, I get a constant shear force like that, whose value is 12 E i by L squared into phi, and I get equal moments on both sides in the same direction in this case anti clockwise of 6 e i l squared 6 e i by l into phi. Is it clear? Now, even if you forget these you can derive these they are not very difficult. So, I hope you understand when you come back to this how we got an expression for delta naught. Is it clear? Now, this is the stiffness that you get it is called the translational stiffness of a shear building when you push it horizontally you get this much deflection. Now, in reality the beam is going to bend okay, and it is a little difficult to work out that formula, but let us take the other extreme. Let us say the beam is infinitely flexible. Can you draw the deflected shape for that? Now, it is not going to be unstable if you put internal hinges there. So, how much will it move if it is infinitely flexible? So, this is a bending moment diagram. Uh, can you see for this particular case, this is P, this is 
p by 2 into h by 2 is p h by 4. So, you get typically bending moment diagrams like that okay. and k has a, k has a value of 24 E i c by h cubed. Let us put hinges, how does it behave? If you have an infinitely flexible beam, how will the columns behave? Simple cantilevers. So, that is easy to calculate. If you do that calculation, you get p h cube by 6 E i and your bending moment diagram will look like that, because your beam will have no bending moments, right? because you have got hinges there. So, it is very interesting. I have looked at all the extreme cases. The summary of this, so here it turns out to be 6 E i c by h cubed. So, take a portal frame, a symmetric portal frame, take the base as hinged, your horizontal stiffness is going to vary between 0 and 6 E i c by h cubed, that is what we saw in the previous slide. Fix the bottom and it is going to, the minimum value will be 6 E i c by h cubed and the maximum value will be 24 E i c by h cubed. So, uh, when you when your beam is infinitely rigid compared to the infinitely flexible case, the stiffness of the whole frame gets magnified by a factor of 4. Okay. Uh, so, you the sum and substances you can write in terms of uh, lambda, finally, it is between 6 and 24. Okay. Now, the whole idea of doing this is uh, to tell you that when they first started building uh, tall buildings, tall frames, uh, they found it very difficult to manually analyze these highly indeterminate structures. So, they took shortcuts. Okay, for gravity loads, they use a concept which we will see a little later called substitute frame method, where they just took one floor and they assumed that the columns were fixed at top and bottom, so it was much easier to analyze. The argument was whatever happens far away from this story is not really going to affect that flow. It is a hunch which works out well, you can prove it with Mueller Brislaw's principle. When it came to lateral load, it took some time for them to work out a simple way of cracking the problem and they came up with a brilliant idea. They said let us make some assumptions and make that whole frame statically determinate. Okay, so, uh, some methods evolved over centuries and they are still popular today. How do you convert and I want you to give me the ideas, how do you convert uh, in an indeterminate frame to a statically indeterminate for the sake of approximate analysis. Now, take a look at this, at this point I want to convey, at the bottom engineers often have this worry about should I model it as a pinned support or a fixed support. When do you model? foundations as fixed and when you model them as uh, as hinged and the reality is somewhere in between often. When is it hinged? When your soil, when your foundation can rotate, when, when can it rotate? <laughs> well, when you have a shallow foundation, when you have isolated and even sandy soil, when your safe bearing capacity is not very high, because even a small movement there will release whatever moment you calculated. So, that is one extreme. Okay. When do you model it as being fully fixed? Okay, when, you, when let us say you, are, you even have an isolated footing, but it is resting on very hard strata, there is no way it, the rock is going to rotate. Okay. Or you are on piles and the piles have a pile cap which is heavily interconnected. Okay. So, in such cases you can go for uh, a fixity, but the spring shows you can handle all conditions in this situation. Now, one, one thing you can notice, I am now taking one type of frame only in this session. Let us say the frame is single bay, single bay means just one, just two columns in one story, but multi-story, single bay multi-story frames. 
and let us say that it is symmetric which is what it normally is that means all the columns on one side are the same as the columns on the other side. If the wind is acting from left to right you call these columns as windward columns and these are columns are referred to as leeward columns right. Now, because the frame is symmetric you can assume this to be made up of two loadings one is symmetric the other is anti symmetric just divide p 1 and p 2 by 2 and put them equal and opposite here and then put them here on the same side. So, this is called an anti symmetric loading it is called symmetric loading when you add the two you get back the original loads there is a great advantage in doing this the advantage is this part the, the symmetric part is very easy to calculate you end up getting actual compression in only your beams. Will there be any deformations? No, you are assuming uh, actual deformations to be negligible in frames. So, the first part you can practically throw away and so all the bending moments, all the curvatures, all the deflections are coming from the anti-symmetric component. It is very interesting. Not only that, you will find that there are points of contraflexure always in the middle of the beams they have to be in the middle of the beams because of this kind of behavior when you whether you push it to the left or right your behavior will be the same right and all the columns are moving in the same way. So, you will have points of contraflexure always in the middle of beams in such frame in symmetric frame, but in the columns they could be anywhere. So, that is the uh, other issue to note. Windward and leeward columns at any story level deflect identically, they share the story shear equally. Now, let us understand the meaning of story shear. So, we are saying this hinge, I mean it is not a deliberate hinge, it is just the fact that the bending moment there is changing sign is going to be in the middle of the beam, but this hinge could be somewhere in the middle of the column, we have not yet proved that it is exactly in the middle. And similarly, this hinge in the lower story is somewhere. Supposing the bottom is hinge, then this point of control flexure will actually shift to the bottom. Is it clear? So, we do not know where this is, but one thing we know for sure we know that this hinge and this hinge will be located at the same height. You agree? This hinge and this hinge will be located at the same height. Now, let us say I cut a section here along this, wherever the hinge locations are in the columns and I leave take out the top part then it is like a cantilever it is taking some lateral load that is referred to as a story shear look at the word story shear is the, the lateral load taken by all the columns in one story. So, if your load here is P 2 the story shear in the second story is P 2. Now, if I now cut a section at the lower story then the upper story is part of that, that section. What is my story shear? If I cut a section here, it will be P 1 plus P 2. So, you will find the ground flow columns take more shear than the upper story columns. So, they have they will be uh, you know loaded more heavily and can you realize? So, the point made is this story shear will be shared equally by this and this and this story shear will be shared equally by this and this with that assumption we can uh, solve this problem. We will stop here and we will complete this, uh, this very interesting simplified analysis in the future. Thank you.